Hello everyone, welcome to Urbanus podcast, uh, second uh, day off in Lithuania, but in basketball there are no uh, days off. Yep. Rytis Višniauskas, uh, Donatas Urbanas, uh, here we go again to talk about uh, some interesting stuff which is happening in the EuroLeague. Yes, for sure. We're going to talk about the last week's games. It was a double week. We had a lot of interesting games and also some news about uh, some clubs making moves in the market and uh, other stuff. So, yeah, there's plenty to talk about. And as you said, there are no days off in basketball. Four players, four coaches, and for us as well, for podcasters, commentators, journalists, everybody works e- every day till the season ends. Yeah, and let's start <laughs> with uh, champions. Uh as Efes? usual. As usual. <laughs> yeah, FS yeah. is a great team. They have uh, great players, a great coach and stuff. And there's a lot of uh, to talk about them, especially when they were struggling like that in the beginning of the season. And it, it was a pretty hot topic, actually, on Twitter. Because, uh, first of all, after six rounds, they were they had only one victory. And it actually marked the, world, uh, the worst season for the EuroLeague champions in the modern EuroLeague history, uh, which is since 2000s. And uh, some people on Twitter suggested that maybe Ataman is in a hot seat and maybe he's the one who should be replaced, you know, to to wake up this team and stuff like that. By saying some people, you mean like journalists or uh, you mean like random fans? I, what do you mean? I think they were mostly fans, but uh, journalists were also raising questions. If Ataman is in a hot seat and let's answer this question in our podcast, what's your take on this? Well, my take is very simple. I think Ataman built this team. He made them EuroLeague champions. He made them an elite basketball team. And now he has the same roster, so he deserves a chance to defend the crown. Uh, And yes, they are struggling. But I think he still has a lot of credit uh, for what he done in the past couple of years. And I believe his position is absolutely safe. The only way I could see Ataman being fired uh, is if players would start going against him but uh, kind of kind of openly and yeah, yeah, when, yeah. when he will see that he cannot control the locker room or the team that, is that, losing that's 10 the games only in way. a row but i don't see anything like that at the moment they had like a rehab game against Ralgiris uh, Vasa Mitic came back from his injury. Uh, of course, Vasa is very important for this team. And if Vasa is not playing due to injuries and Shane Larkin is simply not himself, he's shooting terribly uh, in the recent games, uh, they're, they're going to struggle. And uh, they have some players not in a good shape. They have some injuries they're dealing with. Uh, it's a good thing for them that not only Vasa but Kruno also came back and, and had a good game against Algiris. So it's it's not a surprise to me that um, they're lacking some chemistry. Um, they're vulnerable on defense. Panathinaikos had a had an amazing shooting night, especially Makon uh, uh, with nine three pointers. He was uh, laughing. So yes, Pau the way he was shooting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, close to a Euroleague record, I believe. Pau is not a super team at the moment, but if players like these get hot, it, it becomes difficult to control them. And yeah, the thing about Pau was that they showed the way how um, less talented teams can win games in Euroleague. Yeah. They were very intensive from the beginning of the game. Jeremy Evans was grabbing rebounds from two FS players uh, inside the paint. Uh, for example, uh, Kendrick Perry, although he's still uh, struggling on the offense, he didn't let uh, Rodrigo Bobois or other backcourt players uh, brief. Uh, and they were just killing them intensively. And what uh, FS, uh, where FS has problems is uh, uh, transition defense. They just... They're just too lazy to come back. Yeah, their pick and roll defense, defense also looks not so great. Defense uh, in general. Yes, I mean, Brian Dunstan has been known as a rim protector or paint protector in, in the EuroLeague for a decade, I would say. Uh, he's getting older. He has injuries. Uh, if you play with Tibor Plais or, or uh, Filip Petrushev, uh, other teams will definitely attack them with their pick and rolls, and you might have some problems. You will have to take some risks. It's normal. Um, I don't see them being an elite defensive team. Once again, they were winning titles because of their talent, because of their ball movement, chemistry, and amazing playmakers they have. They still have these players in these places, and they added Elijah Bryant, who looks very great in in, in the first games he played for FS. So, in no way I I believe that Ataman is on a hot seat. What, What do you think? I completely agree. Uh, as you mentioned, either he will lose the control of his locker room or they will lose 10 games in a row. I think 
uh, he he's the coach who deserves to decide when his pro- project is over and w- where he deserves to decide if he has to leave the team. Uh, but when we, when it takes teams like FS, we have to have an mention. Uh, we have to know that FS is run by uh, a billionaire. Uh, his name is Tonsai Ozilhan. Sorry for the pron- pronunciation. But the thing is that he is the boss of that team, and uh, um, it's it's like a toy. The basketball team uh, FS is like a toy to him. Uh, he's a very rich guy. I think that in 2014 he was on Forbes list. He was like uh, made the list of thousand billion top billionaires in the yeah. whole world and stuff like that. And I talked with some uh, of my sources in, in in Turkey, and they explained that uh, uh, when it takes sh- such owners like Tonsai Ozilhan, sometimes you never know. Uh, when his mood will change regarding to his basketball teams because uh, he has history of uh, firing, for example, David Blatt uh, the season after he won the Eurobasket. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, the Russian national team. Uh, he also fired uh, Dusan Ivkovic uh, pretty pretty easily. Uh, recently, he fired uh, mm, one of the mm, club's uh, managers, uh, one of the biggest club's legends, Aydin Ors, uh, and he's a bit famous uh, for unexpected uh, unexpected moves. But when it takes Ergin Ataman, I think that uh, he will stay there at least until the end of the season. And we have to understand that FS is on a hangover and let's let's wait until they get sober. I mean, let's wait until they get healthy. Yeah. They will have all the roster set until they get serious. Because... Um, I, I can, of, of course, there are some concerns. They are getting older. They are not as hungry as before, but they have all this talent and it, we shouldn't, like, it, it's only the beginning of November. They will start playing seriously only in February. So they have, you know, all the privilege and, you know, uh, all the reasons to, to wait until the last part and of the season. I am 100% sure that none of these elite teams like Barcelona or Milan or Real Madrid would l- want to see FS as a number seven or number eight seed going into the playoffs. I mean, imagine you win the regular season and you're facing Anadolu FS yeah. in the quarterfinals. Nobody would want to see that. And I don't don't think they will be number seven or number eight. They will be fighting for the top four spot eventually. Yeah, um, especially when we see so many unpredictable results, especially when we see Asphal as a fifth seed, Makab as a sixth yeah. seed, uh, Monaco, Zenit, uh, Olympiakos, very high. It's, it's too close right now after seven games. Yeah. But we are actually getting some answers uh, watching FS this season. Uh, my point being that uh, the rebuilding starts now. Elijah Bryant is one of these signings. Uh, with their budget, they can afford to change six or seven key players in, in one summer, which they will have to do from what I'm seeing this year. James Anderson, Chris Singleton, Kronoslav Simon, Brian Dunstan. These are veterans that probably are playing their last season in FS and they will have to change them with some younger, fresh players. Yeah, of course, Vasa Mitsic question, him moving to the NBA will be open every summer. We don't know what's going to happen with him, but I, I'm 100% sure that they will be rebuilding and replacing these veteran players next summer. Yeah, maybe not so fast. I mean, not in one summer, but uh, year uh, after Three year. Three or four in changes, I believe, will be made next summer. Definitely. Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like every summer, yeah. Uh, three changes is probably enough to, to change some, let's say, and older then, pieces. And then in the summer... At the same time, you decide if you want to mo- continue moving forward with Ataman and do this rebuild with him, or you look for some changes in, in, in the personnel. It depends, of course, on what happens this season. They are a playoff team. Whether they are a Final Four team, they will still have to prove it. I mean, it's hard to predict. You don't know who they are going to face in the playoffs. Uh, it's so far away, this uh spring i believe in april yeah. the, the playoffs are in april right it's hard to tell but um for now i don't think it's fair to raise the question about ataman's seat yeah i agree and uh, for now i cannot see any reason for ataman to step down because when you think about it what else he would be doing i mean i don't see top euroleague teams uh, hiring him at the moment 
Uh, I don't see any other Turkish team which would like to hire. He will never work uh, for yeah. Fenerbahce. He will never be hired by Fenerbahce. And I remember he had some dreams about becoming one of the board members of Galatasaray Hall organization, something like he that. He was talking about NBA opportunities as well uh, recently. <laughs> but he he was uh, even you know he he was him uh, honest uh, to himself actually that he, it's it's probably impossible for him, but. Anyway, I mean, I don't see any uh, motivation for him to step down because I don't see any plan B for him. Coach stepping down in this modern era is out of the question. No coaches are stepping down these days. Everyone's waiting until the very last day. And if the club makes the decision to part ways, you get the compensation and you move on. But coaches stepping down, this is something from 20th century where your dignity is sort of tarnished and you lost some games, you feel very bad, and, and then you step down. These days, it's not happening in professional sports, whether it's football, whether it's basketball. Coaches are not stepping down. If I would see any of these EuroLeague coaches stepping down, let's say Dusko Ivanovic struggling and going to the press conference saying, guys, it's over. I, I don't have anything to offer to this team anymore. I'm stepping down. It's not happening. Mm. You're gonna wait till the very last day, and if but you, you know, Ataman is different. Ataman he is, is, is different. Powerful. Yes, I, if he would do something like this, you would have to respect his decision. But I think that knowing his confidence, he's looking at the table now. They're two, two, two to five. Yeah, no drama there. He's just thinking, okay, next week we're gonna win our game. Then the next week we're gonna win another one, and then the next one, and the next one. Maybe this uh, game against Algiers was like a confidence builder for them because they had a. It was, yeah. Ataman they had a good shooting night. They won by thirty-four points. Uh, probably some of the players felt better after the loss in Athens. Masa Mitic played after his injury to get back some rhythm. So this this game was sort of important l- for them looking to the future, to the nearest future. Yeah, because when we remember the first victory of FS, it was a very tough win yeah, uh, against, against Unix. So they kind of needed the game like that, you know, to win in a very solid way. Uh, and they did. But yeah, Jalgiris became, last week, Jalgiris was a kind of, you know, rehab uh, team, both for FS and Maccabi, because Maccabi went off uh, uh, winning against Barcelona. Uh, and I remember what we were talking about Maccabi before that double uh, game week, and now they were tremendous uh, the last week. But yeah, let's let's talk about Jalgiris. Uh, probably is the team which ha- already had the m- most changes so far. They fired the coach. They have new coach Judas Dots. They also uh, signed. It's not officially. Uh, they didn't sign the Ty Webster officially, but he's already coming to Vilnius, so it's a no-brainer that he will be a Jalgiris player. Uh, it seems like Emmanuel Moody is also out, at least uh, what uh, our sources uh, say, and it's all also a matter of a few days when it will be official. So and it's not the end. I mean, there are some rumors that they are still looking for a big man. And you didn't mention Zoran Dragic. And yeah, Zoran Dragic, officially a yeah, new member of Jalgiris Kaunas. And there might be some changes. Some players might leave. There are some rumors about Niels Gifai, about say about Tyler Kavanaugh, for example. So the Jalgiris is making uh, Jalgiris are making uh, moves. Uh, but let's talk uh, about the first moves they made. For example, Zoran Dragic, probably the first official signing. What yeah. do you think about this addition? I, I saw your comments yeah, on yeah. our Patreon page. And yeah, you so were disappointed with that signing. Disappointed is not a word. Uh, it's not like I had a lot of expectations. I know that for these low-budget teams to fix their mistakes done in the summer is almost impossible. There's no quick fix to this. I mean, best-case scenario, you win some games and you end up not in the last place, but somewhere in the 15th or four, 14th. I think that's the reality. Uh, but Zoran Dragic, uh, I mean, he's a good role player, but he's a good role player who is moving to a team which is built on role low yeah. role players. There are no leaders. There are no. There's not a, enough quality and not enough leadership. Zoran Dragic is a good role player playing next to Luka Doncic in the Slovenia's national team. Zoran Dragic was a good role player last season in Basconia playing next to Pierre Henry, Rokas Gedraitis and, and other players. 
but I don't see Zoran Dragic being like a primary ball handler or a player that uh, solves the issues that Jalgiris has right now uh, regarding offense and, and creating shots and making shots. Yes, he has some good qualities. He can drive to the basket. Uh, he plays with a lot of energy and a lot of heart. He's a hard worker on defense. Juris Dovts knows him very well. So there are some good things about Zoran Dragic. But uh, for someone to step into this roster and be a game changer he has to be a player with skills and quality not another role player which is by the way throughout his career injury prone mm. 32 years old kind of similar to Yanis Strelnik's situation I mean when I saw the signing I said okay Zoran Dragic good guy but he doesn't change a lot in my opinion I just think that we have to look at the bigger picture because uh, okay, we n now we see that Ty Webster is uh, coming to the team, and it, which means Jalgiris is uh, is now making more moves, uh, and maybe it's only the beginning of some big changes for this team. Because, for example, uh, I don't see the reason why Jalgiris should keep Nils Gifai right now after signing Dragic. For uh, I mean, I see Zoran Dragic as kind of upgraded version of uh, Nils Gifai. But let's be fair, Nils Gifai is playing better than one of us right now. Oh yeah, I mean. But Actually, one of us is a Lithuanian. So. Yeah, and Niels Gifai is, to be fair, he's one of the best players on Jalgiris team right now. The way he plays, the, the quality he brings to the table, because there's not a lot of quality uh, so far. But when you have Zoran Dragic, then you have uh, Niels Gifai, Ulanovas, they are just very similar. They play kind of the same position. Okay, Dragic is more two and three. Yeah. Gifai is maybe, if some say he can play four. I don't see him playing four. But Depends okay. on the matchups. Yeah, yeah. But uh, then you also have Ulanovas. I just, as you mentioned, we have too many role players, and especially in this position. I don't see if mm, they need to, to keep uh, Nils Gifai. Well, you can raise a lot of questions about some other players like Tyler Kavanaugh as well. Oh, you you would course, like to upgrade yeah. the power forward position. Yes, they're looking for another big guy. I believe they're looking for more of a center. Uh, in my opinion, you Which would I need a like. power forward yeah. because uh, at the moment you are in a situation where you extended Paulus Kunas for his final season for it to be like sort of his last dance. Uh, the fans are back in the arena, so it's the better way for him to retire than it was last season. Uh, but you you would imagine him in, in a five-minute role, yeah. something like Felipe Reyes was yeah. uh, with uh, Real Madrid in his final season. Yeah, sometimes he was playing, sometimes not. But now he the becomes game. the main power forward. He has to play yeah. like 20 minutes, uh, which is not good, of course. And yeah, so some other moves you could imagine uh, might improve this team, but uh, I think that this season is just sort of dead. I don't think that they can resurrect the season with signings like Zoran Dragic or Ty Webster. Okay, it's, it's good that they're doing something, that they are reacting. Obviously, for Jalgiris, it's not only about EuroLeague where you finish in the standings. It's about winning the, uh, the Lithuanian Cup, the Lithuanian League, which they, I think, will manage to do eventually. Um, but, okay, Role players. I've been saying this from the very first day. It's a nice team with nice role players. But role players are good when they play in a role in a certain team which has leaders, quality, playmakers. It all starts with the playmakers in modern basketball. If you have uh, good guards, you can live with your small forwards or power forwards or centers being limited. But Jalgiris doesn't have good playmakers. Let's be fair. We watched this game in, in Istanbul. Kalnietis, it seems like EuroLeague is too much for him at this point in his career. Lekavicius, he can play... He's a great he, backup. He, but he can play yeah. runs, like in three yeah. or four yeah. minutes. He steps he off the bench. The he boosts, Just like Zoran Dragic, for example. Yeah, and, and what else? Strelnex, Moudier is injured or leaving the team. It's just not enough. And Ty Webster, yeah, we, we talked about Zoran Dragic. Ty Webster, uh, last time I saw him, he was in Galatasaray. Playing in Turkey, mm. he played actually against Vilnius Ritas. Um, Twice, yeah. He seemed like a decent scorer in a Euro Cup level. That's my impression. He can score the basketball, definitely. He's a good shooter. That's all I can say. Is he an improvement uh, comparing to Emmanuel Moody? I think it's a safer option. He played in Europe. He knows how to play. He played for it's his national team. Also, yeah. He's a better shooter. So it's a safer option. 
uh, how much quality does he add to the team? I am not sure. I'm not sure if he's a EuroLeague player. Does he have it in him? He he never played in no, EuroLeague. No, no. Yeah, only in the EuroLeague. That's Cup, a big so. adjustment for him, and we're not sure because. When we talk about the highest level, if you want to perform at the highest level, t- you have to be consistent. He was not uh, consistent even on the EuroCup level because in some games, like in EuroCup Top 16, he was great against uh, Kazan, Monaco, against Ritas. He was like, uh, he had two games, uh, two quite bad games. One in Vilnius, I believe he, was, he had a game where he went he scoreless. He didn't control his emotions in one of those games and he got like two technicals. I don't he was ejected. I, I believe it happened when it he might played be against Vitas. Because he's uh, quite a pretty hot player yeah. on the court. Yeah, he's emotional, uh, quite emotional both on and off the court. And that's the never adjustment he will have to make. At least why he's different from compared to the ever uh, Jalgiris players that he's, he's not that typical good guy. Like yeah. Jalgiris signed all these uh, players this summer. He's a bad guy, actually. And uh, we'll see if it goes go- uh, good or bad. Uh, of course, you, you know, w- when you see these signings, uh, you naturally raise a question. Why are these players free agents in November? Because if, if it is... with Ty Webster's so story is different. He he had a two-year yes, contract I know, with New Zealand I know, Breakers, I know. but he... So, but that's a yeah. question mark once again. Uh, he was in this situation where he didn't want to get the vaccine. Now he, he he, vaccine. he's vaccinated, so he's moving to Europe. You're not sure what's happening in his head now with Zoran Dragic. Again, why is he a free agent? He had a good Olympics, but he's a free agent in November. Why? Yeah, I, I try to ask uh, about both of uh, guys. Yeah. And uh, I was told that uh, Zoran had uh, something like a, a couple of EuroLeague offers, but they were not good enough. So he decided to, to wait because probably in Zoran's uh, case, Usually teams during the season, they like to have additions like yeah. Zoran Dragic. You're example, 32 Blue years guys. old, you can afford to wait. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding to Toy Webster, uh, his story is more uh, um, interesting because uh, I know that a lot of people were surprised that Jalgir signed him. First of all, he had interest in Europe and um, some Europe Cup teams, some French, German teams, average teams uh, had interest in Ty Webster. But we were talking about the Euroleague, Euroleague club. And uh, when we see Jalgir the situation, they need a scorer right now. Uh, the guy who would, you know, uh, would raise Jalgir's level to replace Emmanuel Moody, uh, you know, it's it's an important role of that on that team. And we're talking about the guy who was playing in EuroCup, who was, you know, uh, on the radars of some mediocre European teams. Can he can he match that EuroLeague level? That's the big question. I actually I like the way Ty Webster plays. I think he plays the right way. Uh, uh, he's okay. He's a scorer first. He's a more a scorer than a passer. Although he's a combo guard, he can play both uh, both positions. And I watched a couple of games in Galatasaray, and he kind of shared the uh, playmaker role with some other players and stuff like that. And he was okay. He's a scorer, but he's a smart scorer. Uh, when he see opportunity, when he sees opportunity to to pass the ball, uh, he can do it, and he can make some great nice. He was assists. averaging almost four assists. In, yeah. In although his t- uh, turnover. Uh, ratio was just terrible. I don't have a stats yeah. right now. Yeah, it, it was, was uh, three point three point one turnovers. Yeah, to three point seven assists. So it's just zero point six. Yeah, uh, that's that's th- that's that's really bad. Uh, but when it takes uh, Jargidis and the uh, Euroleague expectations, in Jargidis we were missing a player who could play. Who could have ISO plays? Yeah, one on one. Nobody in this team can play one on one. Ty Webster is not a one on one player. Uh, half of his possessions in Galatasaray were after pick and rolls. So, in switch defense situations, okay, in New Zealand Breakers, uh, he had g- he had good stats. I think he, in synergy, he was regarded as a you know good ISO player. But again, his his main strength is pick and roll plays. And if, I don't know if that will answer uh, the main questions well, it, Jalgiris have on it, their offense since they're the it's just worst that offensive team. Jalgiris really. is limited in the market. Oh, it's, yeah. it's very obvious. And when I when I said that, uh, why are these guys free agents? Uh, they're like two type of players you can sign at this point of the season. They are players who were chasing their NBA dream. Maybe they were stuck in some G League teams, but they are available and you can sign them. And there are players that are out of the NBA um, and they were just sitting and waiting. Like Zoran Dragic for one reason, Ty Webster for another reason. So in my opinion, um, better options are these hungry NBA players. 
you risk with them, you gamble. It sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes you can get a uh, Derek Walton or or uh, Emmanuel Moody, but sometimes you might hit a jackpot. So uh, Jalgir is, is choosing safer options in this case. Uh, Zoran Dragic, uh, proven Euroleague but veteran, and Ty Webster who played in Europe already. But I see Ty Webster as a bet and as a smart bet be- because he has European experience and it helps a lot actually. You have nothing. And he to has lose. upside, you know. The thing is that you have nothing to lose, yeah. Jalgiris. Uh, what? You, you're in the last place already. So if you finish dead last, it will not be because you signed Webster or Dragic. It will be because you made yeah, bad yeah. choices in summer. But if you but get better and, and get some wins starting from this week's game against Alba, some people might say, okay, they made good moves. Uh, they went out of this situation better than expected. So... I just like the idea of Ty Webster that at least there is some upside and as, as far as I've heard, he will be signed also for the next season. I'm not sure if it will be guaranteed or not. But uh, he's a hungry player. He's still an unproven player. He has upside. So it makes a l- more sense, you know, compared to, for example, Zoran uh, Dragic signing because, you know, he's a veteran role player. and Everything is okay with him, but I don't see any you know long-term vision uh, for Jalgiris with this signing. So, so Jalgiris next summer will have to sign six or seven new players. Yeah, but at least you have to, you know, play some guys for the next year because you cannot change all the team because in this situation, probably you will have to change nine players. Well, we're talking too much maybe about the most boring EuroLeague team at the moment, but, uh, well, we're Lithuanian, so what can you do? Uh, In my opinion, it's very simple. Uh, Žalgiris has been stuck for too long with this idea of a Lithuanian team. Yeah. There are not... too too many Lithuanian players that can win games for you in EuroLeague. The idea of a Lithuanian team, we see what's happening now. They signed veteran Lithuanians. uh, They brought back Ulanovas. They build a team of role players. They're paying them money for them to be leaders. They are role players. So there are... I don't see any Lithuanians that could actually be elite players for Žalgiris right now. They cannot afford Grigonis, yeah. uh, Gedraitis or Gudaitis. So in this case, you go the Bayern Munich way. You build your team around Americans uh, and a Serbian guy and uh, Italian coach. Because there are no quality Lithuanians, let's be fair. What can they do next summer? Bring Even back, Lama bring back he's too expensive. Yeah, uh, what he's is bringing expensive. to him, he's too expensive. You so cannot pay. You cannot afford the player like him. I think it's time to. Talk. I would talk facts. Yeah. If you want to win, it cannot be a Lithuanian team. No more. If you want to win next season, Jalgis would need to have like eight foreign players, and the Lithuanians would have to be the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh guy on on the roster. But it's it's on Jalgiris too because something is wrong with youth system. All these players like Kalnietis, Jankunas, they are coming from the same generation. And except from Jokobaitis in the last five, six years, I cannot name you any good player which came from Jalgiris youth system. Youth system. Of course, Grigonis case is different. He was playing for the youth team. Uh, then he went uh, for the second mm-hmm. Spanish division because he didn't make the uh, main team uh, in Jalgiris. But... Anything like, but I mean, not too many teams in in Europe uh, get a lot of talent from their youth system. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's the Spanish clubs mainly, uh, Barca or Madrid, or Basconia even. Uh, but it's it's okay. You can live with that. Just admit that you cannot be a Lithuanian team and go the other way. Mm. I don't think people in Bavaria are complaining that there are too many foreigners playing for Munich when they go to the playoffs. I really don't think that people complain. They enjoy seeing a winning team in their city. So, Jalgiris fans would also accept that as long as the team is playing good basketball and winning games. Yeah, I would keep only Lekavicius and Blažević, uh, probably. Lekavicius, yeah, off the bench, has a boost, as you said. Ulana was for smaller money if he proves that he can still play. But it has to be a um, much smaller money. But the problem is that it has to be a smaller has a contract. Contract. two year guaranteed contract. Yankunas is retiring. Okay, Malaknis is on his uh, contract year too. So yeah, we can expect some uh, changes uh, regarding this quiz to this question. I, I think that Polis Matunas he's not you know dumb and he, I he hope understands so. the situation. I hope so. Well, we have uh, Francois Lamy in oh, Algiers, yeah. right? So next season maybe we'll see more of his work. French so. players, yeah. 
Eli Okobo. Eli Okobo, yeah, let's bring Eli. <laughs> now, it's, now, it's not, now it's impossible. In the summer, probably it was possible. That's a good topic because yeah. some, some teams won the lottery, won the jackpot, like as well. Some teams didn't, like Jalgiris with Moody. Yeah. Do you see Moody playing on the EuroLeague level and being a solid uh, guard for any EuroLeague team? Because, okay, he's leaving Jalgiris, but uh, he's expected to stay in Europe. And per EuroLeague, per EuroLeague rules, uh, he will be able to sign with another EuroLeague team from round 16 to 18, which is then the end of December. So he will be on the market uh, in the EuroLeague. Do I, I, I don't him? see any EuroLeague teams picking him up right now. I don't see any. And... Uh, I believe his personal experience with Euroleague basketball so far would s- w- would sort of push him back to the NBA to try to get there some way, play in the G League. Maybe maybe he's going to accept an offer from China, I don't know. Uh, but in Europe, at the moment, I could see him maybe on a Euro Cup team. Maybe. If he proves there that he can play, next summer he could get some better offers. But right now... I'm looking through all these teams and thinking what they have in their point guard positions. Do for you which see of him these teams instead of Frank Kamp in Zenit, for example? No. Because for no. me Frank Kamp is also terrible. Yes, but I, are two yes, different. I agree, but uh, And I have a hope that maybe Chave would know how to use, you know, strengths no. of uh, Moody, but the thing is that no. he's not the player, he's not this, that kind of profile player which you is need to be a by good, good shooter to play there. Or playmaker. They have enough shooters in Zenit. Yeah, but uh, if you are a playmaker for Chavi, you play a lot of pick and roll, so if you are a pick and roll you have player, you shoot. have to be able to shoot, with, which Shabazz Napier can offer, and he will be back from his injury. No, I, d- I wouldn't see him there. I wouldn't see him on any of these teams because they have a r- have some really solid point guards, whether it's Vesda with Nate Walters, whether it's uh, Alba Berlin with guys like Mao Dolo, these combo guards. Jalen Smith was struggling for Alba Berlin, right? Yeah. He's having seven points per game, very inefficient shooter so far, 33%, two-pointers. But I don't see I don't uh, see Moody playing for any of these teams uh, in, in the EuroLeague. Uh, actually, my prediction was that uh, if, if it doesn't work for him with Jalgiris, uh, in December we will see him in the G League. But if you say that the reports are that he's willing to stay in Europe, yeah. so maybe. It probably makes more sense for him because you can get more money in Europe. Yeah, G yeah. League, that's that's a different story. He's 25 years old. Yeah, he's very young. I, I, I he just needs to get his career back on track. I think it's that in Europe it was very bad timing for him to join Jargiris because in a more talented team, in a more successful team, he would have more time to adjust because his team could afford, you know, waiting for Moody when other players are performing and the team w- was winning, for example. But now, since all the team was really, really, really bad, they just couldn't wait any longer for him. But uh, these teams like Jalgiris, uh, of course, they're going to invest a lot into the point guard, into the main point guard, and the expectations are high. You're signing Emmanuel Moody to be your main point guard, so maybe it was not uh, discussed in detail enough with with Moody's uh, people and Paulus Motiunas about his abilities to be good right here, right it was, now. It was actually discussed because S- even Paulus Matinas told that they knew that they will have to wait for him. So and maybe they project. were expecting that Kalinjata Strelnik and Lekavicius will be better than they are. Or maybe they didn't but expect that he will be so bad. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I was it's actually qu- kind of excited when they signed Emmanuel Moody uh, at that day. But in the end, we see that the gamble didn't work and it was never in his favor that the coach changed. Maybe with Martin Schiller, it would be a different story, but Juris Dovts is demanding. He needs a, like a classical point guard, European type of player, and Emmanuel Moody is just different. And also injuries didn't help. He got injured a couple mm. of times. He missed some games. He had a decent game against Olympiakos where we thought like maybe this is a breakthrough game for him. Then they go to Tel Aviv and he gets hurt. He does, didn't play against Efe, so... Yeah, he had some games. The thing is that even Jalgris veterans uh, were protecting him. They were saying that in in the practice before games, he looked really good. He he knew uh, he was playing smart. He was not kind of you know uh, lost in space or something like that. Sometimes it happens with uh, Euroleague rookies, so that kind of you know uh, make them believe that he will be good in the future. So I I don't know. I I still you know 
I still think that in a better situation, he might be more productive and a better player when he was in Jargis, but uh, it will be tough for him to find I'm that still, kind of place. Uh, I mean, I still cannot get over the fact that Jargis was chasing Corey Walden and Darren Hilliard and ended up with Moody and Strelnix. Uh, I can't get over it. The, the problem was money because they got more money, more in, money in, in, in Bayern. Bayern. Yeah, it was kind of case of one hundred thousand. Uh, but of course, when you see some some decisions, when you see loaded small forward position, why not to split Ulanova's money for a better point guard and a shooting guard? Even about uh, okay, we're talking too much about too much losers. about like I said. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it's the most boring team in in Europe, right? In Euro Euroleague, not in Europe, but in Euroleague. Yeah, I hope that all these changes will uh, bring them back on the map. Let's talk about uh, the best ones. Yeah. We had 18 games last week. Uh, which one would you pick to discuss, or which one you you liked the most? Where there there, there were a couple of those. Um, I believe I saw like six games in, in full uh, but the one that really stuck in my memory is uh, Maccabi Barcelona it was the first loss for for Barcelona of the season I think it I mean Charas didn't say that he said something like they missed the first part of the party they went to the party too late in the third quarter only uh, but uh, they were a bit tired, I believe. They were fatigued because of their crazy schedule. They played on Sunday in Malaga, a difficult game. They played on Tuesday in Istanbul, won by a buzzer beater. Nikola Mirotic made a game winner. It was a very tough game, a very physical game. And then they went to Menorah, Miftahim, with that atmosphere. They were kind of tired, in my yeah, opinion. Maccabi was fired up, and they are a super fast yeah. team. They killed Jalgiris in transition. Yeah, after Jalgiris' game, they got this yeah. good feeling of winning basketball yeah. games, and I guess Barcelona, the first half was, wow, it was amazing. They scored 31 points in the first quarter. They ended up with 56 in the first half because the last three-pointer was after the buzzer. But uh, these are the numbers they put against an elite defensive team. Of course, Bar Barca could not be worse in the second half. They came back. They had uh, a decent third quarter. They actually played some great defense in the third quarter. But the gap was already too big. Uh, Maccabi managed to protect their lead uh, with some big plays from Wilbekin, from James Nunnally. And James Nunnally is actually a player uh, I like watching this season. I remember I'm he surprised. I remember him playing he for Jelko. He was a spot up shooter, and he wasn't an, uh, he was unhappy with that role yeah. because he's a pure scorer. He wants to have ball in his hands. He wants to score to play, you know, with more freedom. In so Jelko's system, he was great. He was super efficient shooting from free. But he was but just standing in a corner. Yeah, that's the Lucas thing. was playing with Vesely, yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, maybe he'll get some he shots. Was just maybe a spot up shooter. Maybe yeah. not. Now I see him playing in a small forward position. He has the ball in his hands a lot. He sort of compensates for Maccabi not having a true point guard because Wilbekin or Keenan Evans are more of scoring guards. Not only plays a lot of post-ups, he reads those mismatches very well. And in these two games in a double week, I actually saw Nunnally and Derek Williams, the basketball IQ that they bring to this team. Wow, their decision-making, the way they're reading the situations. Just amazing players. And, and Nunnally in the interview, post-game interview, said that we didn't have any preseason, so now we're starting to know each other and building this chemistry. This win against Barcelona proves that Maccabi is here to compete for, for playoffs, definitely. And the best part is that with all these struggles, with all that fucked up uh, preseason, they're a 5-2. and two. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect thing. I mean, they were... Really, they were uh, they were really lacking of chemistry on the court and probably off the court. But now, with all these struggles they went through, they are five and two, and, and there's so much potential looking forward. Ante Zizic actually made a great comeback from his injury. Oh, yeah, and now when you have Zizic and he Reynolds, was decisive against Jalgiris. Yeah, and when you have these two centers, they are different, but but both bring some good qualities. Uh, it's very balanced. Uh, obviously, in this situation, you don't need to extend Matias Lasor. Uh, he's on mm. a two-month contract, something like that. Mm. So he didn't adjust. Yeah, Zizic and Reynolds covers the center position perfectly, and with Nunnally, with Wilbekin, with Williams, these are experienced players. And actually, you can see that Keenan Evans and Cameron Taylor are start getting better. Cameron mm. Taylor against Barca had his best game so far. Keenan Evans against Algiers had yeah. his best game so far. 
a lot of positives positives from this double week uh, thing for coach Sferopoulos. Yeah, and uh, I took uh, the game between uh, Monaco and CSKA. Uh, I expected a different game. Uh, I think that Mike James... It will sound crazy, but it seemed like he was under the pressure in this game. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, history behind this game for him. It was a big personal challenge. I think he was affected. I, d- I cannot remember uh, when he missed two free throws. And in the game against Seska, he missed uh, both free throws. I cannot remember that kind of uh, thing. I think happening. in the opening game against Pau, he also missed oh, really? free throws. Oh, yeah. really? Maybe, maybe. But it's so unusual for Mike James. Well, if you ask him... Do you think he would say that? He no, was no, 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 no. He never feels no, stressed. Man, come on. What you pressure? didn't see me play? <laughs> play basketball. Come on, man. What pressure? What are you talking no, about? Of course, it was <laughs> a very tough game for Mike James. And I'm not uh, surprised at all that he scored only eight points. But the thing is, I even have some uh, scre- screenshots uh, on my laptop. There were times when three CSKA defenders were on Mike James. And they were kind of, you know defending him actively and they were forcing him to pass the ball and stuff like that and he did and he did well in the second half the funniest thing is that uh, how that game started uh, I'm a bit skeptical of uh, the lineup uh, which Zvezda Mitrovic uh, t- took for that game uh, he, he they started the game with some crazy crazy stupid plays from both uh, Andusic, Alfa Diallo also Faye they were like playing they were making some iso plays some they were forcing shots uh, shooting really really they had a really bad uh, shot selection and on the other side Tseska was playing probably the best uh, quarter I saw uh, this season in general and especially Alexis Schwed he was it was the best version of Alexis Schwed I saw so far he was controlling the tempo of the game. He was like a chess player. He saw all the moves uh, before it happened. Uh, he was not forcing his shots. He was a great leader, great playmaker. And I was like, it's it's done. I mean, Monaco, they don't have any chance to win that game. And they were like uh, down by 22 or something like that in the second quarter. But Where did that comeback come from? I don't know. They, at first, they showed the character because in any other situation, they just could, you know, lose the game easily, just um, cruise by and just think about the next game. Uh, okay, it was pr- the second game of the week. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, fatigue also makes the p- impact and stuff like that. You know, should, should it happen sometime. But they made some adjust- ad- adjustments. They start uh, to play. Uh, they started to switch in defense. They put Mike James as a point guard. They made some adjustments. They already find the lineup, which is always the case for Monaco because they have like 20 players and Zvezdan, Zvezdan Mitrovic is playing, you know, uh, heavy rotations uh, all the time. But they finally fi- found their players. Finally, they managed, you know, to how to, let's say, cool off Mike James because he was really under the pressure in terms of CSKA giving a lot of pressure on him because Daniel Hackett, he was all, like, Mike James was playing, uh, was on off-ball situations. Daniel Hackett was, like, almost grabbing him. Harassing him. Yeah, (laughs) he was always holding him, and it was was really hard for him even to get the ball in his hands. So CSKA did a very great job, but it seemed like they just felt too comfortable in the first half being uh, up by 22 Dwayne Bacon, I have to say that he had a great debut. Uh, he's a great scorer, uh, but in the NBA, he was not just not efficient scorer. He was the scorer which you cannot rely as your you know, starting shooting guard, uh, for example. In Monaco, it's a different story. I mean, he can be successful. He showed that he can be successful. The only concern I have that they just have too many players, and most of these players came to Monaco, you know, to, let's say, to raise their stock, to get a lot of playing yeah. time, to... to, to have to you know to score is there a limit like on their budget <laughs> i don't know because there seem monaco doesn't have any limitations they, they seemed completed uh, in the preseason then bam they add mike james and will thomas now they add dwayne bacon all of a sudden who who scored 10 points per game in in orlando last season yeah 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 it was very unexpected move yeah. but it seems like uh, bacon was just pissed off uh, of his nba experience 
because he was uh, cut by New York Knicks, uh, I guess. He was traded from Orlando, if I'm correct. Anyway, it was a bad experience for him, and Monaco just used the momentum. They just uh, get directly. It's just a him. challenge for Zvezda Mitrovic to uh, to I mean like distribute the minutes for all these players and to all keep these all the players, players happy. All, yeah. yeah, to keep they're all known of them happy. as a good individuals, and uh, as I said, they came to Monaco. It's not like joining Jelko Bradovic team or Itudis, but you know that you will have to sacrifice. But you're gonna play for titles, right? Yeah, and now this is this Monaco team is very unpredictable, but. That's okay. I mean, they're winning games. So far, it's okay, yes. They won they against CSKA. I mean, have four that's wins. crazy. They have yeah. four wins. Well, for CSKA, it was actually a terrible double week. Um, not only in Monaco, also in France, in, in Villarbon, facing us well, and mm. TG Parker. They lost that game by a couple of points. It was like a cliffhanger in the end. They couldn't make their clutch free throws, but uh, as well, once again, proved that they can play with these elite teams, that T.G. Parker has the skills of in-game management, making quick decisions uh, when he needs to go big, when he needs to go small, uh, finding actually the weak spots of the opponent. Uh, when they were playing with foul early in the first quarter, Seska just couldn't do nothing. They tried with Farid, they tried with Bolomboy, they couldn't get the defensive rebounds. Uh, foul was dominating in the paint. I'm actually stunned with us well oh, yeah. and Elio Kobo wow the numbers once again uh, 20 points per game 64% 2 point shooting yeah. 55 3 point shooting that's crazy he's so, the best scorer so, so TJ and I have him on the, my fantasy team oh. he's my captain man uh, I think more every, than 80 points I think everybody has him on their <laughs> fantasy team at this point not I had him from the beginning actually when he was like 500,000 player yeah so that's a great decision yeah. then uh, but uh T.G. Parker, for me, is like the hero of the week because you manage this double game week, first of all, against uh, Seska, winning against the Tudis team, making all these good tactical decisions uh, during the game, making adjustments during the game, and having a chance to close the game. And in the end, it was Elio Kobo, as the Tudis said, uh, we allowed him too many times to drive to the left. They were, as well, was at, uh, were attacking uh, uh, Foytman in the switch all defense. It was a smart decision, and Foytman just couldn't cope with uh, with Okobo, with Chris Jones, and they're driving to the basket. Also, they were attacking Alexis Schwedt from the very beginning. David Lighty had a ball in his hands a lot. So you could see that T.J. Parker had a good plan prepared for this game, and the players executed the plan almost perfectly. And then uh, you see them going to Athens, and you were thinking like, Pau just had this crazy game against uh, FS with three-point shots, a blowout against the EuroLeague champions. They should be on a high. And Asphalt go there and pff, easy. Yeah, they, they, they beat they're playing like EuroLeague Panathinaikos. powerhouse. Amazing. TG Parker deserves so much credit for what he's doing. And actually, I, I thought like Sfaropoulos could be my hero of the week because of what they done. But no, it has to be has to be T.J. Parker and Haswell. Yeah, and T.J. Parker is proving proving that he wasn't hired for this position just because he's a brother of Tony Parker. No. Because there was a lot of skepticism in France that he got this job just because of that. And even after the uh, winning France, uh, French championship uh, last season, he was crying. Uh, straight after the game or even in the press conference because he had all this pressure you know all this all this shit storm uh shit storm behind him because of that but <laughs> watching him play uh, watching him coaching and uh, the feedback i've got from his former players who had uh, anything to do with him now they were always praising him because he was he i mean he talk, took all these lessons uh, he from etre messina yeah. from greg popovich you know he was visiting tony parker in san antonio all the time he was learning and he was the assistant coach for seven years in this team so he deserved a chance last season was tough in the euro league but again i mean they finished uh, higher than all these and they lost some their league teams like heartbreakers Powell. they lost yeah, some yeah. games that they could have one he looks just so smart and when you listen to him in his post game interviews he says all these right things and uh, he just simply belongs there in the league where you have Vitudis, you have Sharas, you have Pablo Lasso, you have so many different but great coaches and TG Parker belongs there with them and if not as well in the future you could see him in one of these stronger EuroLeague teams definitely because he's, he's 37 year old and he's proving a lot this this season 
Yeah, so shout out uh, to TJ. And the worst thing, the worst case for uh, French basketball fans uh, was that if I understood the situation correctly, most of them couldn't watch the game unless uh, they had EuroLeague TV subscription or something like that because uh, the situation is changing right now because I just talked with my colleagues uh, from France and they mentioned that, again, if I'm correct, that's... Uh, Uh, Lyon's uh, club mm, TV channel or something like that. They brought, uh, they bought uh, Euroleague uh, broadcasts at least uh, of their team of Asvel. Uh, you know, Monaco team. You can watch them in Monaco territory, which is really small, one of the smallest territories in the whole world. Uh, you can watch Monaco games in Monaco territory, but since it's not the French, originally not the French team, uh, French basketball fans. Cannot don't don't have any opportunity to watch them on national te television, and there are some some problems with uh, broadcast uh, broadcasters in France, and even uh, Zvezdan Mitrovic uh, had the case uh, made the case after uh, the victory against Ska. Again, we are witnessing two great French teams in the Euroleague after so many years of them being always on the bottom or even not playing in the Euroleague and stuff. And French basketball fans just cannot watch them on their TV. Uh, but at the same time, we have a solution. Uh, our friends, NordVPN, uh, it's a great uh, service which can help you uh, to watch these games uh, because one of their best fe features is that uh, you, can, you can access uh, your content from every corner of of the world for example i can you can if you're in france you can switch your vpn as for example uh, lithuanian us or stuff like that and you can access uh, uh, all the games streamed on some official channels and it helps a lot actually uh, for us lithuanians too for example to watch some fiba champions league games on youtube and it's completely legal is completely secure uh, they have the fastest vpn service uh, nord vpn Uh, and it's very e easy to use. It's just a one click and you can, you know, change your location and stuff. And again, uh, no logs policy. You can use it on multiple devices and this is what uh, NordVPN can offer uh, to you. So yeah, that's the solution for French basketball fans uh, until all these broadcasters will, you know, make their case. Good. Yeah. <laughs> That was a nice topic. Yeah. I actually don't have anything to say. <laughs> Zero and hero of the week. Yeah. So I said my hero of the week is TG Parker, yeah. definitely. And zero of the week, it's not going to be one person, but it is just Basconia. Oh, yeah. A team full of zeros this week. Damn. Starting from the coach, then going to the players. They got trashed in Kazan. They looked hopeless. It seemed like... You remember when Fenerbahce beat Kazan 80-41? So in the first half of this game, it seemed like Basconia is going to be on the end of the spanking right mm -hmm. now and, and Kazan is going to win like by 40 points margin. It, it wasn't as bad because in the second half, uh, Tarasovic started saving some of his players and uh, naturally Basconia cut the deficit, but it but he looked horrible. Terrible. Were down 29... And you just couldn't see any spark. Where does the offense come from? Wade Baldwin was doing something on his own, but simply on his own. Fontecchio was out of this game. He was terrible. I don't know. Maybe Rokas Gadraitis was injured. Of course, they miss him, but you cannot say that because of one injury, you lose the whole team and, and then you are being trashed in, in, in EuroLeague playing against Kazan, which, I mean, Kazan is not so great thus far. Okay, maybe in this double game week they, they showed some good stuff, mm. but uh, in general, you can play without Rokas Gadraitis against Kazan. And the other thing is that then they went to St. Petersburg and it was even worse. 54-83 scoreline. And then on Sunday they played in Liga Andesa against Real Madrid. Gadraitis came back after his injury and once again they were trashed. So Dusko is on a hot seat. I mean, easy to predict after this week for sure. And what I what I don't like about this team is their centers. Slow, big. Don't have a skill set playing back to the basket. I mean, 
Yeah, it was and a, a no call, especially so limited a problem against Unix because yeah. I like John Brown a lot. He's a great mobile uh, big, but you can you can score against him inside the paint. But uh, you have to have all these skilled players inside the paint yeah. who can play close to the basket. And Basconi never didn't have it near uh, in the paint or beyond the arc because they are so un- inefficient uh, shooting the basket. I don't know, maybe Dushko killed them in the preseason or what? Because you can see Gedraitis shooting threes on 24%, Costello 18 Baldwin 16 I mean, they're they're super bad. I just don't see any passion in this team. Dush- Dushko took all the love. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, they were terrible this I week. I think it's not a joke. I mean, it's tough to yeah. play for Dushko. And as long as you're playing for Dushko, it longer it takes, it usually gets worse. And Seems that's so. why he didn't work in 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 re- rest of his teams he he coached for in in recent years for longer than like, I know one season something like that. I it's don't really know. tough. He's so very demanding. He's tough. He's strict. And since the team is not performing at all, they have 16th uh, worst offensive rating, 16th worst defensive rating. So it, in general, it's, it's really bad. Uh, I just don't see any other solution for them just changing the coach to change the culture of the team. They're just too tired of him. This week, they're facing Maccabi. They're playing at home. So if there's no reaction, no positive reaction in this game, I, I believe it should be the end uh, for Dushko Ivanovic. Of course, it's kind of complicated. Uh, in Spain, you need to hire a coach that speaks Spanish. Uh, there are not too many on the market. In my opinion, a switch from Dushko Ivanovic and his strict coaching to a more positive coach, like, for example, last season, Jaume Ponsarnau in Valencia, could be good on most of these players, like Gedreit, Fontecchio, Baldwin... Uh, Vanya Marinkovic is stuck there, barely playing. He's a good shooter. He could be good on w- in a different system. So I think they would need a more positive coach. I'm not sure if there are any Spanish coaches available right now. But uh, if you want to save the season, because the roster is not hopeless. Maybe you can add a player or two. Maybe you can... Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, release uh, some of these players that are not meeting the expectations but the roster is okay you can compete at least for top 10 in Euroleague but it's just not working right now and I think the decisions should be made if, if they are thinking about it, it should be made after this week's game if against Maccabi you don't see any positives they need to make sacrifices yeah, that's the thing. And my uh, again, I, I'm cheating on your uh, this zero and hero of the game of the week uh, stuff uh, thing. I have Monaco as my zero of the week and uh, the same time hero of the week because the way they once were again, playing, yeah, once again, back. yeah, okay. that was a great comeback. They were super terrible and they were just great. You know, winning. I, against I see a pattern game. that that you're a big fan of these uh, huge comebacks, comebacks right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because the contrast was just significant. You know, you cannot play that bad and played that great in 40 minutes. It's just incredible. But it's it's the way Monaco plays this season. They're an unpredictable team. You you said it many times. And, uh, unpredictable before, team by any means because they're signing Dwayne Bacon yeah. out of nowhere. <laughs> and before this uh, Sky game, they had like a defensive game against uh, Cervantes Vesda. A low-scoring game. Yeah, yeah. 70-62. So in some games you see them uh, playing very offensive in other games, you see them playing slower and actually being good on defense. You don't know what you're going to get with, with Monaco. And yeah, and they have potential because they have so many new players. They still need time to adjust. They still need uh, time to adjust to all these new players coming in every week or two. And, for example, Mike James is not playing his best basketball yeah. so far. It's it's clear he's scoring only 14.4 points. and He's not efficient shooting beyond the arc, 27%. Uh, he's far away from his best shape, and we can expect much, uh, much more from him. But we were never questioning the talent uh, in this team. We, no, we, no, we no. were always questioning whether they will get the chemistry and whether whether Mitrovic can put these players in the right, uh, right mm-hmm. places. So far, he's doing a great job. Really, four wins, only three losses, and knowing that one of those losses was against Barcelona in an overtime, you can say that it's it's going great for them so far. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go. Uh, we have rankings prepared yep. for this week. Every yep. week we'll have uh, some rankings, uh, either made by uh, Ritis or myself. Uh, from now on, from this week, we'll start uh, with Ritis. And the question is, uh, 
three most favorite teams to comment? Yeah? Yeah. Um, first of all, I have to give an honorable mention to Anadolu FS. They didn't make my top three, but uh, you always enjoy watching them and you always uh, wait for Ataman's uh, interviews because he is very honest in, in these interviews. Sometimes he criticizes his own players. Sometimes after the win, he says they played perfect basketball. Sometimes, as we saw against Algeris, he doesn't even talk about basketball. He talks about the uh, uh, Republic of Turkey. Yeah. So it's a great, uh, great TV entertainment in any case, whether they're losing or winning. Uh, but I left them outside my top three. It's just an honorable mention. My top three teams would be like, and I'm not ranked Ranking them from yeah. first to third, just all three of them. Random order. First of all, I want to say Real Madrid. Amazing organization. Continuity. Uh, wait, 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 wait. You're a Barcelona fan. I'm You're a diehard Barcelona fan. I, I was having a party with you <laughs> until six in the morning, and I remember how for like 15 or 20 minutes you were trashing one lady <laughs> in, in that room. But for me... Because she was a Real Madrid fan. But for me, this doesn't go like football and basketball. Okay. Because in, you basket split, you know? in basketball, Barcelona has very little in common to, to Barcelona's uh, football okay. culture. And uh, the same goes for Real Madrid, let's say. In, in football, they're like Los Galacticos, signing the most famous players in the world. In basketball, they are just building a great team with mm -hmm. positive characters and with the same coach for, for 10 years. So these are very different sections Approaches, for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's leave football. Okay. There I just and, wanted and to make it clear, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying I'm a fan of Real Madrid, <laughs> but but one of my favorite teams to comment because uh, because there's continuity, because you see the players are very happy there in this organization. Uh, they sign contracts for three or four years. They're happy playing with each other. They're sharing the ball. They don't need, they don't need many set plays. The team is just based on great chemistry. They know each other so well, these veteran players... The new players that they bring in, they always adjust very quickly because they do very good scouting. Uh, they uh, look for guys that speak Spanish, uh, some Ar Argentinian players, some players that played in other ACB league teams. No, like French like players. They were high French in Argentinian players. players but now French they're... players that played in Spain previously, Coser, Ertel, uh, Poiré, all of them played in Basconia. Mm -hmm. uh, so always making smart decisions in the offseason season. Now you see them selling players to the NBA clubs and making profits. And they're exciting to watch because Pablo Lasso allows the player to show his talents. These guys, I think all of them feel great playing in this system. If you're a shooter, you, get, you will get your shots. If you're a ball handler, you'll have the ball in your hands. You just have to live with the fact that sometimes you'll play 15 minutes, sometimes you'll play 25. However, Pablo Lasso decides. But the season is long. There are a lot of games and a lot of opportunities for everybody. At the same time, every season you see Pablo Lasso giving at least one young player significant minutes. Now you have Carlos Olosen, you have Vukcevic, you have Nunez. In the past it was uh, Garuba, Doncic, a lot of examples. It's a fun team to watch, always. Mm. I agree. Yeah. I would also have them on my top three. So that's one of them. Uh, moving on. Uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv. Yeah, you're a big Maccabi fan this I year. Since I love uh, American basketball culture, this is the most American club in in the EuroLeague. Uh, and also... But you're talking about this year's Maccabi, right? No, every year they are American. But sometimes they just make some bad decisions. But yeah, in, in the last couple of uh, with, years, they were unwatchable. Well, with Nevens Pachia, it was an unsuccessful project for sure. But ever since uh, Sferopoulos came in, he started doing some good things. And now they're signing better players, uh, making smarter decisions in the market. But they are always exciting for me because of the American basketball culture. They have American players, um, usually experienced American players, and the atmosphere. I mean, I, I'm watching this on television, but I can feel mm -hmm. the Menorah Miftahim just going crazy. This game against Barcelona, it was just something amazing. And uh, you can only imagine the feeling that they are inside of the building. So because of all these reasons, Maccabi Tel Aviv is definitely in my top three. 
Okay, yeah, we're talking about the fans, uh, about fans, uh, I will probably discuss more about them the next week because I will have my own top three European EuroLeague experiences, uh, rankings and stuff like that. So the third team. Third team. Moscow. Okay. Seska. Because of Dimitri Situdis' super modern basketball. The emphasis on good spacing, the emphasis on percentages, uh, knowing the players' strengths, uh, where they need to be, what shots they need to take. It's a team built sort of like an NBA, based on NBA uh-huh. model, based on numbers. You also have a continuity. Also having continuity, also having the same coach. Of course, it helps with their big budget. They always sign elite players. So you can live a rebuild from having Chacho, Decolo, Higgins, uh, Heinz, and Hunter to having Milutinov, Shengelia, and other great guys next season. But uh, they're great to watch. I think for any person who wants to learn more about basketball, it is good to study how CSKA, CSKA, I'm I'm getting used to saying Mm. CSKA, how they play. Just watch their games, maybe in more detail sometimes. Just pause and watch how they set up on offense, how they go get back to defense. It's a very, very good team with very smart players and a coach that is, um, I would say, my favorite coach right now in, in, in the EuroLeague. Barcelona is also a very detailed team, but you in a have different, them in a different way. One of the, let's say, un- most unwatchable teams. It's very different. For CSKA, it's uh, about spacing and numbers, as I said. For Barcelona, it's about running sets. It's, it's very dif- different. Mm-hmm. Itouris is demanding. Let's let's be clear. He's not the Pablo Lasso type yeah. of coach. He's he's very demanding. In, in, if you, if you do some mistakes on defense, let's say you can go to the bench and sit there for for fifteen minutes. I, I think if Lundberg suffers something like this in the game against us, well, he made a bad. Uh, a bad rotation on defense. He was sent to the bench and, and he had to sit there for like 12 minutes. But Barcelona is very different. Uh, I mean, CSKA has been uh, leading in the EuroLeague for the last couple of years in three-point shots. Now this season, they're starting to play more from the post, from the inside. Yeah, because they had... Uh, yeah, no to they, they're, they're changing their, their game plan. Uh, but Barcelona, I believe if, if it's Sharas, it doesn't matter whether he has Higgins or Calates, he's going to mm-hmm. do his own thing. It's it's a good thing. He's he's winning games. He's competing for the titles. But Mike James said that for for him Barcelona, he respects the Sikavichus mm. and the way they play. But he, he doesn't like watching them. And I cannot say that Barcelona is is a team that I am super excited to comment. Cesca is definitely in my top three with with Madrid and and Tel Aviv. Yeah, I like her Cesca uh, choice because I, I always liked uh, love to see the process behind something and uh, I always love to play uh, compute PC games like uh, Heroes of Might and Magic if you remember well mm-hmm. uh, you know strategy all the strategy games and stuff so I see the huge different be- difference between Barcelona and CSKA but I like the way I like the process uh, the way they are playing and stuff like that so CSKA uh, Barcelona Milan although uh, Messina is giving much more freedom to his players than before and stuff Fenerbahce under Jelko before these these were my favorite teams to watch and of course you know my my flavor of basketball was also influenced heavily by Sharuna Sesikavich because uh, uh, I started watching him more closely, of course, when he was a head coach. It was since 2016, so I was uh, 25 years old. You know, my basketball understanding was still shaping and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, my both, you know, career as a journalist and, let's say, the knowledge of a uh, basketball fan was heavily impacted by Shadis. And I, I learned, learned a, yeah, I learned a lot about basketball uh, watching through his eyes. And even now, sometimes for me, I love uh, to watch teams like Maccabi, uh, FS, and all these high-tempo teams. But sometimes I get myself thinking like, Sharas, oh no, why you, why you didn't make a foul in, in <laughs> like uh, before bonus? Why you didn't stop that transition play and stuff like that? And oh, that was bad shots. Why why you made that shot so I think early it's in every, the position? Every Lithuanian right yeah. now. My my mom is a big fan of Žalgiris and, and we discuss their performances uh, usually... Um, 
And uh, before Sharas, I would never hear those phrases. When Shara started coaching, she would call me and say like, why did they make those stupid fouls in, in bonus? Uh, they were allowing this guy to drive to the left. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, we never okay, emphasized okay. all these <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know what? For me, uh, to watch Jalgiris under Sharas was very exciting. To watch Barcelona under Sharas is they're less wasting exciting. Talent, talent, right? Not wasting, but when you see elite players doing those things, mm. you're kind of thinking, mm, they're superstars. You mm. want to see them playing this free yeah, yeah, free with point. freedom. In Jalgiris, you would see him growing a team and helping these players to show their talents to whole Europe. Yeah. And then you get Brandon Davis going to Barca, then you and get Kevin Pangos to, to going go there. beyond their limits. Yeah, yeah. Vasa Mitic in Jalgiris was a role player. Mm. He moved to Anadol Efes, he's the MVP. So watching Jalgiris play under Sharas was really a breath of fresh air in Lithuanian mm. basketball. Watching Barcelona play under Sharas, also watching Barcelona play under Pesic, it's not really what I like in, mm. in, in basketball. Although I agree, they're they're great. They're one of the favorites to win the EuroLeague for sure. Yeah, and this week also will, will be very exciting. We have Milan Barcelona game. They're on the top of the standings so far, six wins in seven games. Uh, some other great games. I had the schedule on my laptop. Anyway, uh, just check the EuroLeague schedule oh, and stuff. Oh, Cesc and Erbakce definitely. A lot of one of those. A lot of games between, you know, close teams. Yeah. Uh, for example, even Alba Berlin and Jalgiris. I mean, uh, bottom teams uh, fighting for very important I wins. I think and Bayern, stuff like Real Madrid and, and Cesc and Erbakce are two games to watch. Fenerbahce, what do you think? Are they just unlucky? Or is there something wrong? Uh, I think there, uh, definitely there is something wrong. Uh, first of all, Perie Henry is not making shots. Uh, also, they're lacking of, um, let's say, they're not smart enough in the end of the games, uh, especially some plays by Devin Booker, not only in Athens making all these unsportsmanlike fouls and uh, dead, uh, dead clock situations and stuff like that. Uh, uh, also, mm, I'm not sure, uh, I mean, none the, the call was kind of a clear team leader before in Fenerbahce. He was really great. He was a very efficient scorer for that team. But in the end of the games this year, I don't see him having a ball enough. And I, I remember had uh, these stats that he was playing seven from seven to eight minutes in four quarters uh, last season. And this year he was playing... Uh, five minutes, up to five minutes, something like that. His usage rate uh, dropped significantly. And I'm not sure if, you know, the ball, if, if Djordjevic is giving the ball to the right guys in these crucial moments, and especially when Henry is not making shots, all these, some let's say, stupid plays in the games, they're missing some luck. That's true, but of course there are some more things behind it. And I'm kind of surprised that Marco Guduric is struggling uh Okay, in this double game week, he, he had better had numbers. Injury in yeah. the preseason, maybe it impacted his, his start of the season. Because he was a game changer last season when he signed for them, when he came back to Fenerbahce, and Djordjevic knows Marko Guduric very well, mm. so he should be one of these key players for them. So far, he's averaging seven points per game, but in a double game week, we saw him playing more minutes and, and scoring in double digits. Maybe he's going to get better. But uh, I think they just brutally, they're just brutally unlucky. Uh. Yes, there they might there might be some problems as you mentioned, but looking in the standings now they're two to five. They could be five to two very easily, easily, <laughs> easily. by a couple of shots. They lost in Adams against Panathinaikos because of uh, unsportsmanlike fouls in the end of the game. In they, eight seconds, uh, yes, they lost in Madrid where they also they were had up by three with like thirty had seconds an left. like foul. And also Booker made an offensive foul, uh, fighting for Boyer the rebound. made the free, the free throws. Yeah. Then uh, Sheyak had a wide open jumper in the mm -hmm. end. He he just couldn't make it. Now they lost against Olympiakos by two uh, against Barca with Mirotic making the game winner. So unlucky. I mean, mm. super unlucky. And, and I cannot say that they are playing bad. Yeah. They, they're just not consistent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. They go for runs, then they then they stop. They go for run again. They just lack consistency, but they definitely don't lack quality and experience. They should start winning games uh, sooner rather than later. And, and, you know, again, we are getting back to the process uh, because Fenerbahce is 2-5 and, and we are so relaxed talking about them. 
we have Basconi at three and four, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, a whole yeah. Com- it's, different, it's different story. Yeah. So M- maybe not as relaxed about Fenerbahce as we are about FS, but yeah, 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 of course. But they should start winning these games. And you see the roster; these are experienced players. They shouldn't be broken by these losses in, no in the in last seconds. No way, no way. They can they can take just it. Just need some more luck and some few adjustments in the end. But I agree that uh, I would like to see the Colo having a uh, the ball in his hands a lot more and making more decisions because he still is, in my opinion, one of the best shooting guards in Euroleague right now. Best guards, not shooting guards. He can yeah. be a point guard. Uh, the way he played for France in the Olympics, it showed that he still has a lot to offer. I think another team I wanted to mention quickly is is Unix. Mainly because I was in, in my imagination, they were uh, an offensive team with a lot of scorers, with Hezonia Cannon and all these guys, Lorenzo Brown. But what they are showing right now, thanks to Coach Perasovic probably, they are actually playing slow basketball with not so many possessions, but solid defense. And when you keep Real Madrid with 58 points it shows that you're doing some good things. Yeah, they have the second-best defensive rating and the 18th worst uh, offensive rating, actually. I don't know how far can they go, but I I couldn't have been more wrong about them. I imagine they would be one of the top-scoring teams Uh in, in, in the EuroLeague this season, not one of the top defensive teams. But so far from what we're seeing, especially in this double week where they beat Basconia and, and Real Madrid, they're very defensive. Yeah, because they put lineups like Lorenzo Brown, Gerald Brantley, Hezonia, Voroncevic, John Brown. Hey, they Vo- switch everything. Voroncevic, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to stop you there. He's the your hero of the week, no? <laughs> uh, I, I tweeted like he was playing like prime Robert Horry against uh, Bosconia, yeah. <laughs> making shots and making these backdoor passes and everything. And then he went on and played just as good against Real Madrid, playing almost 30 minutes. It seems like... He, like his best days in CSKA. Do you remember when he was in CSKA? He was one of the better stretch four type of players yeah. in Europe. And the last season, uh, what was interesting, none of these uh, Euroleague teams wanted to sign him. He was in Nizhny Novgorod, and right? He played in Nizhny Novgorod. And now he had an amazing week. He had uh, 14 points in a win against Basconia and 13 points uh, against Real Madrid. So, wow. And against Basconia, he was doing everything. Four offensive rebounds, three assists, it was one of his best career nights, actually, in numbers. Yeah, 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 really. Okay, and let's let's uh, finish our pod uh, with some fan mail. Again, we we selected three uh, comments uh, from our uh, YouTube listeners and viewers. Uh, so we kind of inspire you to to comment all our videos because we will take uh, from time to time every week some some uh, comments to discuss about. Uh, for example, we can start uh, for, uh, with Mantas. Uh, food for thought. Imagine an NBA system in Europe. If there is a salary cap, players will start uh, choosing their next club by the climate and lifestyle they can have. Uh, Lithuania and Russia <laughs> and any other uh, country from northern or eastern part of Europe that would uh, participate will be like Timberwolves, Hornets, Cavaliers. Exciting. Uh, <laughs> not exciting emoji at all. <laughs> but uh, I like the, the idea of this question because I remember I was um, doing it f- for my own fun, let's say, uh, comparing NBA organizations and NBA markets with EuroLeague markets. For example, what would be uh, your EuroLeague New York Knicks or what would be your EuroLeague San Antonio Spurs? Yeah. Probably uh, Barcelona San Antonio Spurs, no? I would go for Barcelona or Real Madrid, like these teams from California, like Lakers and the Clippers. Oh, because of the climate. Because of the lifestyle and the climate. Uh But the game style, you have to take it in consideration also. But but the game style, it changes when the coach changes. Uh, Barcelona in the past had... uh, But they have Pesic before. Well, they had had Xavi Pascual. They had different coaches. Uh Uh-huh. I, I I would compare these organizations based on other things like mm-hmm. climate, budget. Talent. Are they attractive uh, for 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 talented players? Uh, what Manta said, um, it's an interesting point. However, there are only twelve spots on the roster, 
and uh, Euroleague teams sign European players as well as American players. So obviously the priority would be to play in Spain or Tel Aviv or even Greece. Mm -hmm. But still, the roster is limited. Not everybody can, can, can join these teams. So somebody would go to Kazan or Kodas. There's no salary cap right now, but there are many players that uh, have similar offers from two clubs and they consider these factors like the climate for my family, what's better, mm. for, for example, where I want to live. Augustin Rubit, two or three years ago, he turned down Himke offer, uh, which was maybe even higher by 100,000 euros or even 200,000 euros and he went to Olympiakos. Yes, yeah, so it's happening right now even without the cap space. If there was a cap space, uh, I don't think, first of all, that the system could work in, in, in EuroLeague because teams have very different budgets. They don't uh, sign players from the revenue and the income. Seska has no revenue and no income, but he can sign mm -hmm. the top players from the top shelf. And Moscow, for example, if you talk about Russia, is not a bad city for an American to live. It's like uh, Toronto, no? It's, it's <laughs> glamorous. Yeah. Moscow is glamorous. Yeah. Climate, yeah, it's another thing. Well, it's an interesting point, but there are many... Question marks. ...hypothetical situations mm -hmm. which we cannot uh, cannot test whether they would work or not. Uh, but definitely right now it's happening. Players are choosing where it's better for him to live, for his family, climate, language barrier. All these things are important. Let's go with an, an hour. Yep. Uh, one, uh, Max S. Great episode, guys. Thank you, Max. I'm a Zenit fan. <laughs> I'm a Zenit fan, believe it or not. I believe we, we it. Can <laughs> believe you. Because Zenit has a, uh, have a great fan base, actually. Probably they are in best basketball? supported uh, uh, Russian team in the EuroLeague. I think so. I like the atmosphere. Mm. From my impressions, uh, I always thought that like Krasnodar is this... Oh. I'm talking about Euroleague teams. Basketball city, say. but yeah, Euro yeah, Euroleague yeah. teams, yeah. Zenit is kind of a new team. Mm -hmm. They're known for football, of course. I saw Artyom Zuba in some of their home games, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, continue. Okay, so that Zenit fan, uh, we believe you, Max. Uh, he's from St. Petersburg, and I've been really impressed by the performance of our coach in the last two seasons. Of course, Chav is the, the GOAT. Very happy with the results so far, but sadly have to agree that we don't have the potential to make the top eight this year. I wanted to ask you Lithuanian people about our teams, Lithuanians, Godaitis and Kuzminskas. How do you guys value them? For example, Kuzminska seems to be no longer EuroLeague level and is far from what he used to be, for example, in NBA. With Goudaitis, it's a tricky situation because he's a good rebounder and under the basket scorer, but it's not uh, he's not able to stretch the floor and he has bad mobility. How you guys see these players' potential over the next few years? The thing about... Uh, I will be short. Uh, the thing about both of these guys, I think that in order to be the best version of themselves, uh, they have to be in some specific situations. For example, Arturas Godaitis, I think that he's the player uh, who has to play, uh, who has to have a very clear role on his team without any pressure from the, uh, from the bench, uh, which means he wouldn't handle Zvezdan Mitrovic rotation. He has to know his clear role. He has to get uh, solid minutes in order to be efficient. And in all these situations, under a good and smart coach, he will be a great uh, center for your team. Kuzminska's scenario is a bit different. In order to be efficient and a good player, he has to play a lot of minutes. For example, in Krasnodar, he was playing uh, great basketball because he was playing uh, 30 minutes per game. He was uh, shooting a lot of shots and stuff like that. Now in Zenit, his uh, role is not very clear. He's uh, playing, he's not playing and stuff like that. And I don't see him uh, being efficient in all these short breaks. F just for him, it's uh, tougher, you know, to be efficient. Like, for example, Mantas Kalnetis uh, in Krasnodar, he, he needs to have Lithuanian national team the same. He needs to control everything and he needs to get a lot of minutes to be efficient. What's your Well, I, I answered actually in, in the comments, but I can just repeat myself that uh, Arturas Gudaitis, for him, is basically staying healthy. When he was healthy, he was great against. Uh, uh, he Milan. was great for Milan uh, for uh, playing uh, 
uh, for Coach Messina. He was great last season for for Chavi Pascual as well, but got hurt. He's a strong guy. He is a he is smart. It's kind of underrated because he's very silent, but he's a smart uh. guy. I like him. Uh, I like his personality. As 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 it was mentioned by Max, he's great under the rim, grabbing rebounds. Uh, you can say he's limited, but uh, that's why you have Poitras. You have two different yeah. centers, and you distribute the minutes. Gudaitis can play like 18 minutes per game and be very efficient in the first quarter, in the third quarter, in the fourth. You go with Poitras, obviously, because you can switch all on defense. I don't have any problems with Gudaitis. I think he could he can stay in Zenit. He can play for Pasquale. Now, Kuzminskas is a different story. In my opinion, Mindogas Kuzminskas plays plays good when he's in his comfort zone. He was in his comfort zone in Malaga under Joan Plaza. He was in his comfort zone last season in Krasnodar in the Euro Cup. Uh, with Coach Pashutin, you play very open basketball, a lot of possessions. Kuzminskas would get uh, a lot of post-up plays. He can play in the third and fourth positions. Now he signs for one of the elite yearly coaches for a club that has ambitions uh, to play in the playoffs or maybe even challenge for the Final Four. And he signs sort of as a backup for Mateusz Ponitka. In this role, for Xavi Pascual, I just don't see him as a good fit. And f when he steps on the court, he seems so, I don't know, lacking confidence. He makes a couple of mistakes on defense. He's, he was never known as a good defensive player, let's be clear. And then, for example, game against Barcelona, as I said, he stepped up off the bench with, with Karasyov, made some terrible decisions on the court, went back to the bench, never came back to the game. I wouldn't be surprised if Kuzminskas changes his team during the season. Oh, really? Because if he's unhappy, and I cannot see him being happy in this eight-minute uh, role. I think... How old is he? 32, uh, 32, 33, something like that. I mean... But what I are his priorities right now? Does uh, he want to still play? He always, be relevant? He always wanted to be in the EuroLeague. And especially when you play for a smart coach like... Uh, but he's Xavier. irrelevant right now. Yeah, he's but irrelevant. He, will he will have enough time to be relevant in, in uh, lower level teams. Uh, he has... I mean, I think that he has many years uh, to play on a lower level in Eurocup, for example, and to get a meaningful minutes but and a meaningful role. It just doesn't seem to me as a good fit for, for this particular team and their coach. Because where was he at his best? With coaches like Pashutin, Jean Plaza. These are not coaches known for attention to detail yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and strict game that plan. That was a surprising connection, uh, a yeah. surprising signing by Zenit uh, this summer. That That's for sure. Uh, I just uh, had hope that uh, if Chave is signing uh, Mindogos Kuzminskas, he has something. Uh, he had some idea uh, for him. So far, we see that uh, Kuzminskas is not uh, consistent. He's not getting minutes and, and stuff like that. But I'm not sure. You know... It, Probably we should ask this, uh, Chave. If Kuzminskas was signed to play in VTB and to keep some players uh, fresh for the Euroleague games, or what was his idea? Because if that's the case, I mean, I think Kuzminskas is uh, doing okay. I don't see his stats in VTB so far. Well, in Euroleague, you can, but in you can see very clearly. Eight, eight minutes, minutes per game, yeah. 1.9 points per game, 16% shooting. But I mean, it's, it's if that's okay, probably we also should ask it uh, Mindogas, if that's okay for him to get uh, this limited role in the Euroleague, but to enjoy Euroleague atmosphere, to enjoy St. But Petersburg and stuff. But if even if you are in a limited role, you need to be good at it. I cannot say that Kuzminskas is performing good in the games where he plays his 8 or 10 minutes. Because again, as I mentioned, he has to play a lot. Yeah, to be, uh, yeah, yeah be, as yeah, I said, he has yeah, to be yeah, in his yeah. comfort zone. And with Gudaitis, I'm, I'm kind of calm. I think he, he's okay. Yeah. As long as he's healthy, he's okay. He's a good center. The last question, Rokas Rim. Uh, will Baldwin ever in the season surpass Granger in Basconia's main point guard position. I, I believe it's possible if if we will have a coaching change in Basconia. We because sort of under probably under every other head coach yeah. he would be a main point guard. Well we sort of uh, plan to talk more about Basconia answering this question mm -hmm. but we already yeah. talked about them and their struggles. Um well, he is a main point guard, you could say, right now, because, for example, in Kazan, he was playing like 35 minutes, uh, having the ball in his hands a lot, scoring. Uh, I agree that Wade Baldwin maybe needs a different coach and a different system. 
Jason Granger is he's more trustworthy because of his experience. You know what you're gonna get with him. But Jason Granger is not the Jason Granger from four or five years ago. He had his Achilles injury. Yes, in Alba he was good, but it was Alba, Alba. Berlin, not one of those elite Euroleague teams. So Jason Granger is a good role player. Mm-hmm. Good but if he, but he, if he's your main point guard and you're building your team around him while Wade Baldwin is searching for his place, you're losing games. It's simp- as simple as that. In the season, in the long distance, Wade Baldwin has to be the main point guard. But if it doesn't work, then either you part ways with Wade Baldwin yeah, yeah. or you part ways with Dusko Ivanovic. I agree. Yeah, You cannot be like... Uh, Playing with Baldwin 29 minutes against Milan, then 18 minutes against Alba Berlin and stuff like that, because it's kind of you know uh, a bomb uh, which is coming you know sooner than later. So yeah, but I believe that Dusko will be replaced, and they either they will find a different role for Baldwin, or they will just part ways because it just doesn't doesn't make sense to keep him in in Vittoria in this role. Yeah, that's all, folks. Right? I think so. I believe so. Looking forward to this week's games, and next week we're going to be here once again discussing. Maybe you can leave um, in comments what would you like to hear yeah. from us? What Some questions. What, what format would you expect in the future? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's boring for you to listen about every game that already happened, so uh-huh. just leave your uh, feedback. Yeah, we're looking forward uh, for your reactions, comments, questions, and everything else on our YouTube channel, Basket News, uh, Basket News YouTube channel. Yeah. And you can also uh, can follow us on basketnews.com.